Good morning, everyone. It's 9.04 a.m. on February 9th, 2023. The um, first meeting of the 2023 calendar year for Region 6 San Jacinto Regional Flood Planning Group. I'd like to do a call to order and first would like to thank the Harris Galveston Subsidence District for allowing us to be here. Uh, this is where we'll be having our venue as we go through the first half of 2023. Uh, great facility, look forward to participation and look forward to um, our members of the flood planning group to have opportunity to come join us at this seating. And we do have some members here present today that we do the roll call. Fatima. Present. Aliyah Vincent. Present. Kenneth Burden. It's difficult to hear, guys. Present. Can, can, can we give Fatima a mic? Cause... Yeah, she needs a mic. Dean Fisler. Present. There should be a little button. And, and while we're doing that, it looks like we have some noise coming from some folks who are on, but not good. Okay, con continuing roll call. Matt Barrett. Present. Elisa Donovan. Present. Connie Cockier. Present. <laughs> Paul Law. Rachel Powers. Steve Costello. Tina Peterson. Here. I see you on the screen. Can everyone please mute their mics on on the call? Thank you. Bob Bird. Present. Brian Maxwell. Maxwell. Christina Peterson. Christina Tejero. Present. Neil Gaynor. Present. We're now going to continue on with our non voting members. Hope Zubek. Here. Michelle Ellis. <laughs> Michelle Ellis. Melinda Johnston or alternate Kim Nigan Justin Bauer I'm present. Good morning. Sorry, audio issue. 
No worries, Justin. Ely Alcori. Good morning. Fred is here for Ely. Thank you, Fred. Thank you. Tom Height. <laughs> Michael Turco. Um, I believe that Mike is giving a presentation on the north side today and is not here. Noted. Uh, Brandon Wade. Sally Baco. Um, I am here. Lisa Mayers. Okay, and that concludes our attendance for the non-voting members. Now moving on to our liaisons. Todd Burr, you are here. Steve Costello is also here. Mike Turco is giving a presentation. And last but not least, uh, Liv Hasselbach. And that completes our roll call. Thank you, Chima. And I do would like to confirm for Kima, you show 13 members present. All right, moving on to item number three, registered public comments on the agenda. Do we have any registered public comments? I would note that a um, written public comment was provided and has been made available to all the board members and um, should have also been made available to our technical consultant. <coughs> Move on to item number four. Texas Water Development Board update. Megan. Hey Tim, good morning everyone. I don't have anything that important today. We are in the middle of final plan review, so that's what our team is focusing on. Uh, but I don't have nothing. I don't have anything I need from you all today, so we can keep right along moving. Thank you, Megan. Item number five: approval of the meeting minutes from December eighth, twenty twenty two. The meeting minutes have been distributed to membership. I should have had an opportunity to peruse those. Are there any comments or clarifications? Very, very minor comments, Tim. Um, <clears throat> item eight, there were just a couple typos. Second paragraph says Ms. Puckett gave an overview, should say of the public comment of is missing. And then last paragraph, or excuse me, third paragraph, item eight, near the bottom, it says Mr. Bush had called or a vote instead of for a vote. That was it very much. Right. Uh, Matt, I heard you to double check with Claudia post meeting to make sure she gets those minor comments. Any other comments, questions? Hearing none, I'd entertain a motion. This is Aaliyah motion to approve the minutes as revised. Costello, second. We have a motion and a second to approve the December 8th meeting minutes with revisions indicated. Any other question, discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Can you abstain? Motion carries. Thank you. Number six, announcement of new alternate members and new non-voting members. Fatima, I believe we have two. Am I correct? Um, we have Gary Bezimek has been named as a alternate for Tina Peterson. And I believe um, Ms. Mayers, Lisa Mayers is an alternate for the core. Thank you. Glad to have you present today. I know. Number seven, next item, liaison reports pertaining to other regions, progress, status, and other related entities. And we will entertain anything that Todd can share on the Trinity. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, the Trinity ad did adopt their plan. They had uh, additional data could be submitted in for inclusion in the amended plan. And the deadline for that was January 27th. So uh, they will be getting their um, additional data together and ready to present their uh, final plan to the uh, to the water authority. Um, coming up just like we will. Thank you, Todd. Steve, update on the Natchez. Uh, very similar progress. Uh, they 
I think we meet later part of this week or next week. We actually follow our meeting and um, they're doing the same thing we are. They're looking at the conversion of FMXs into FMPs and adjusting their budgets for item 12 and 13, similar to what we are doing. Uh, so I'm, I'm anticipating a meeting next week. Great, thank you, sir. Um, I believe Mike and Brandon were not on today. So we'll move to the Gulf Coast Protection District. Sally, how are you this morning? I'm very good. Um, good morning, everybody. I'm sorry I can't be there in person today. Uh, being so close to Galveston and Friendswood, I normally would have been there, except I have to be right back here. So just real quick, I'll update you on the Gulf Coast Protection District. As you recall, the Coastal Texas program that includes the storm surge protection project uh, was authorized and signed by the president uh, on December 23rd. Um, at this point, we have uh, a House bill and a Senate bill base budget bills, I should say, uh, introduced at the state legislature that would include 500 million for Gulf Coast Protection District, 200 million the first year, 300 million the second year. That's 24 and 25 biennium. We're very excited about that. What that does is continue the state's commitment towards the Sabine to Galveston levy system project that, um, as you may recall, the feds had advanced their funding completely for that project back in the Bipartisan Budget Act of 2018. So the state with this funding, 300 million of it, uh, would, go to, could, would go towards that commitment of non-federal share. The remaining 200 million would be our initial non-federal share for the Coastal Texas program. Um, meanwhile, uh, I was in DC uh, last week and joined in a meeting with the Assistant Secretary of the Army for Civil Works and his staff to discuss the Coastal Texas project and the importance of this project, not just for this region and this state, but for the nation in terms of protecting its economic supply chains. And he was uh, very receptive to that, um, to that discussion, uh, we provided him fact sheets demonstrating how several other states, approximately 16 other states, are impacted from a supply chain perspective. So we're feeling real good about that. The, he wants to work closely with the Southwestern Division and the Galveston District in breaking up this. This is a mammoth project. It's a $34 billion project. So he wants to figure out how we can break up this project in manageable chunks so that it is moving forward as expeditiously as possible. Um, but uh, we have the capacity to, to demonstrate, improve accomplishment. And obviously the first thing uh, on the list is going to be getting through the pre-construction engineering and design specifically for the gate system but also more attainable items such as the beach and dune system along Bolivar and um, West Galveston Island, as well as many of the ecosystem components. So um, with the state legislature signaling they're prepared to step up with um, a non-federal share uh, really makes this uh, a, a very compelling time for us. So we're very thrilled about that. The Texas House Appropriations Committee uh, will be having their organizational meeting next week. GCPD has been invited to attend, but Senate Finance is having their hearing on the GLO um, legislative appropriations request. Um, this is their kind of first uh, strike out of the gate type of type of hearing. That will be on Monday. Um, as you may not may be aware, um, GCPD's funding for the Sabine to Galveston project has come through the general land office. And at least at this point, the state legislature is anticipating that same kind of 
money flow occurring with both Sabine to Galveston and Coastal Texas. So um, next meeting, I'll have a lot to report on our hearings, and I believe that's it. Thank you, Sally. Appreciate it. Um, for the team, I believe I see Bob Kozar also. So thank you. We move on to item number eight, officer elections. Um, we discussed this briefly in um, our past uh, meeting that um, per our bylaws, the beginning of each year, officers need to be elected to serve as a leadership for the flood planning group. And there are three officer positions, the chair, the vice chair, and the secretary. And I believe, Claudia, you have those roles on another slide. There you go. For those who would like to peruse that instead of me reading it. We also have two at-large members that serve to make up the component of the five members of the executive committee. Um, I'm, I'm aware of that mem there's members that we currently have are eager to serve um, with an exception of Gene. Um, and I'm gonna give him a moment to speak in a minute that um, kind of based on where he's planning to be with professionalism and his career and um, service to the public. He is um, willing to offer the opportunity for another member to serve in that large position and uh, appreciate the support he's provided over this last um, year. So, 1 of the things I'd like to do is offer to the sitting members. Um, the opportunity to brief sp briefly speak to their desire to continue to serve and what they thought, you know, opportunity has been to them here over the last year and um, I'll start with my less. Well, rounded <laughs> vice chair. Um, all right, thank you. Well, this is Aaliyah Vinson, and um, you know, I, I, it wouldn't be a discussion about uh, officer election without me referencing the bylaws. You all know that, right? Um, so I will just note uh, for the group before I make my personal comments that in Article Eight, Section Two of the bylaws. Um, Every year at our first meeting of the year, and this is our first meeting of 2023, uh, the officers are, are selected. And so we do this on an annual basis. Uh, the way we do that is with nominations from the floor by voting members. I thought I would just note that. Um, and, then, and then because we really do want to work cooperatively together, uh, voting members shall select officers from among the nominees by consensus, but not less than agreement of a majority of the voting members present. So to, just a little bit of background for folks there. Um, so, you know, we have an executive committee that's made up of, of five folks, as noted, the chair, vice chair, secretary, and the two at-large members. Um, as Tim noted, we, we do understand that um, that Gene is 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 ready to relinquish his at-large seat, and he'll, he'll speak in a moment. Um, I will say I feel like our executive committee and our group as a whole has functioned extremely effectively through what I would describe as some pretty significant challenges, right? Um, this is our very first planning cycle. We had a very, very aggressive schedule. We were able to hit every deadline and complete all of the, um, you know, all of the things required of us uh, as a regional flood planning group. And I'm really, really proud of that. And I would say I feel like we can attribute that to, you know, the dedication and commitment of all of the folks who are on our regional flood planning group and on the executive committee. You know, I feel like the job of the executive committee is is kind of at 30,000 feet, but we got to keep rolling and we got to keep going forward. And uh, and so the executive committee has done a really great job, I think, of keeping everything on pace and addressing any serious issues as they, they have arisen. And so it has been a great privilege and honor to get to serve on the executive committee. Um, and so I would be delighted to continue to serve as vice chair if, if y'all would like me to um, for this next year. Um, I will say I think there is real benefit to our group to keep consistency through the remainder of this planning cycle. Um, so 2023 is when our amended plan will be turned in this summer. I think it makes sense for us to keep as much consistency and leadership as we can through this uh, year. Um, and then, of course, I anticipate there might be change ups in 2024, but uh, I do think it would benefit the group for us to continue uh, for those who are willing uh, to try to keep those same individuals in place so we can keep uh, keep doing the great job that I think we've managed to do so far. So that concludes my comments. Thank you, Leah. 
Erwin, don't mean to put you on the spot as I know you're a pretty new secretary, but um, as also being a representative for counties and also being tied to our um, sponsoring agency, I'd like to give you the opportunity to share your thoughts. I appreciate it. I, I have to echo Leah a lot. I mean, I've, it's been a pleasure to serve the, the committee and the citizens. Um, uh, I would like to look forward to doing that for another year. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we yes. can. Yes. Okay. And um, um, I do take this very personal to me is that I've uh, worked in this industry for a long time and uh, I love to uh, provide whatever insight and guidance I can to create regional solutions. Um, and um, it's very dear and dear to my heart as well. So uh, with that, I, I would like to uh, have the opportunity to continue. Thank you, Erwin. Um, my two at large members, Matt, comments? Not to be the broken record, but I agree with Aaliyah. Everything's run very smoothly, both on the executive committee and the group as a whole. I think we have a good group. Um, uh, appreciate the confidence of the group to serve on the executive committee. It's a privilege to represent the entire region in, in this effort and uh, be happy to continue to do so if that's what the group deserves. Thank you, Matt. Gene? Well, I guess you guys already said it. Um, <laughs> I have had a, it, it, it's important to me to have fun and this has been a hoot. I, uh, I got on this, I got involved in this, what, three, almost four years ago, simply because I felt like I could add something to the formation of the group and be sure in my mind that y'all were going in the right direction. And by golly, I'm not sure I had much to do with that. It, it has all come together. Um, serving on the executive committee, though, is real important. And uh, it's real important that those five folks get along and come to consensus. I think we've had a real good, had real good luck in doing that all this time. But uh, I don't believe I will continue to serve in this role after my term is up. And there's no reason to to set this whole thing up where you have to. I hate having to get together to replace a person in the middle of the year. So I'm going to step aside and let somebody else. Uh, I'm not crying. I just have something in my throat. <laughs> let somebody else step into this role. But whoever does, let me tell you, there's a. It's just going to double your workload immediately. But there's an expectation that you will. Do as good a job as I have. So I'll just leave it at that. But thank you very much. It's been a hoot. Well, thank you, Gene. Um, I won't. I won't be a broken record and go over some things. I feel real privileged to have the confidence to serve as a chair. Um, a gentleman I grew up in the industry with had this seat before myself, who I knew for a number of years, greatly respected, and um, have an opportunity to try to fill his shoes and lead this group. And the adoption of our first plan has been a privilege for me. I will look forward to the opportunity to continue to serve this group in whatever capacity I'll have, but I'd be more than happy to continue the service chair if so inclined. And with that said, I will kind of set the stage for how we'll go through this. So we have 13 voting members present, so that means it's a we, consensus. I think we now have 14 because of oh, Bob Cozart. Bob Cozart, so correct. That is correct. Let me get my notes right. So we will need a consensus, so we'll need um, a eight members to vote in the same fashion. And the way I'd like to set this up, I would like to fill the positions of the chair, the vice chair, and the secretary in a series of nominations and get those positions established as the primary three officer positions. And then we will do a second round where we will then select and through nominations, the two at large positions. We will do the voting through a roll call in which uh, Fatima will call your name. You will need to ensure that your camera is on and provide a response and we'll go through the list. And with that said, is there any questions from the floor? Hearing none, I will officially open the nominations for the chair, vice chair and secretary in whichever order you please to do that nomination but we will pull the three net three or multiple names for those positions to present for a vote. So the floor is open for nominations. Well, if we get to pick, then I would suggest that I, I would like to nominate you, Tim, to serve as president or chair once again. I'll second. Thank you. Thank you. Any other nominations? 
I would like to nominate Aaliyah to fill the vice chair position. I second. Thank and, you. And this is Aaliyah. I would like to nominate Erwin to continue as secretary. I second. Any other nominations? Any further discussion? Hearing none, and with an individual listed for each officer position, I will take a general vote for the adoption of Tim Busha as chair, Aaliyah Vincent as vice chair, and Erwin Burden as secretary of the executive committee for the 2023 window for the Region 6, Region 6 flood planning group. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstain? Congratulations to the officers. We'll move on to the at-large positions. And as I indicated, we have to fill two. Uh, you would be, as a nomination, you can name the two individuals that you see fit. And we'll take nominations until there are no more nominations. If more than two nominations, we will then do a direct roll call vote and the top two vote getters, that may not be the correct term, <laughs> will then be moved forward as the nominees. Um, I nominate Matt for one of the at-large positions. A second, this is Aaliyah. I'd like to nominate Tina Peterson for the open at-large position. I'll second that. Any additional nominations? Should we confirm that those folks would be willing to serve? <laughs> I was going to ask that whether or not Tina is willing to serve. <laughs> well, um, Tina, as I've already gotten Matt's input, would you be willing to serve in the role of an at-large member on the executive committee? Yes, yes, I would. I would be honored to have the opportunity to serve the region in that role. Um, I have big shoes to fill. That's right. That's big right. shoes to fill, but it would be a privilege to to represent this group. Thank you, Tina. Any further discussion or considerations? <laughs> Hearing none, I'll call for a vote. All those in favor of the at-large positions being filled by Matt Baker and Tina, Dr. Tina Peterson indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? Motion carries. Welcome our two, one returning and one new at large member. Congratulations to the officers for the executive committee. We look forward to your service and leadership as we move through the final stages of our first plan and look forward to the support as well from our sponsor, Harris County Engineering, which we could not be doing this work with without you. So thank you. We will move on to item number nine. Presentation and update from the technical consultant of the development of the regional flood plan discussion and possible action for the regional flood planning group as it pertains to a amending the regional flood plan task budget to shift remaining budget in task 111 to task 1213. I'm sure our technical consultant and her team will first brief us on everything that's gone on since our last visit and then help um, provide context for the action item. Corey and your team. We get a, a mic check. Can y'all hear us? It's, it's very faint. Yeah, louder, please. Yeah, louder, please. Okay. Or get closer. They, they've now put two mics in front yeah, of me. All right. This doesn't do the trick. <laughs> Try not to first y'all's eardrums here. So, um, well, as, as mentioned, we're just going to give uh, kind of an update on um, where we're at right now. Um, and, and the final plan that was submitted, um, a, a discussion on kind of how our regional plan stacks up statewide, uh, talk about a budget amendment uh, for the additional tasks we're going to be looking at, and then provide a little bit of an update on the path forward here. So uh, with that, congratulations to all of the regional flood plan group membership. Um, the final regional flood plan was submitted and received by the Texas Water Development Board January 10th of this year. So congratulations to everyone. I know that that was a very large lift 
Um, let's see, I think the clicker might not be all good. Okay. All right, great. Um, so congratulations again to everybody. I, I know how much work this was. Uh, I want to thank the work of uh, the technical committee in particular, just a lot of effort uh, going into this, but also as we'll talk here, there was a very robust public outreach effort. So thanks to the public engagement committee and of course, the executive committee for their administrative duties. But uh, I recognize it was a large lift by everybody in the planning group. And as you'll see here in a little bit, uh, the plan does really, really well to position projects and future studies in our region for funding eligibility uh, down the road. So we'll talk a little bit more about that, but uh, uh, congratulations and thank you to everyone for that. So with that I'll have Maggie give a little bit more details of the contents and just how voluminous this first final regional flood plan is. Yeah, so um, can everybody hear me okay? Okay, I see thumbs up. Um, yeah, so an electronic version of the final regional flood plan was submitted to the Water Development Board on January 10th, including volumes one and two of the report, along with supporting data. Um, as you'll see, volume two, it, we're continuing to, to grow <laughs> the voluminousness of this report as we continue to incorporate projects and documentation to support the inclusion of those projects in the plan. Um, as a fun fact, the submittal size of this final plan was over 17 gigabytes. Um, we had, in addition to the electronic submittal, we also submitted two hard copies to the Water Development Board. Um, if anybody is familiar with or was in person for um, the draft plan, adoption of the draft plan, you're aware of how large those six inch binders are. So um, those were submitted to the Water Development Board as well um, and public comment responses. And those letters were formally um, sent to each individual commenter um, on the 19th of this past month. Yeah, and just to add on to that, you know, thanks to Tim as our chair, um, one of the things that we did as a region that was unique to us, uh, there may have been a couple other regions that did it, but I think we, we might have been one of the few, if not the only one. Um, we provided a written response to every single comment that was received on the plan, and it came on behalf of, of Tim uh, Boucher as the chair. Um, we thought that was important to acknowledge uh, the comments that were received uh, and provide some, some formal response as to how their comments were addressed or incorporated, uh, or if it was noted, um, however that, that was uh, taken into consideration. So. Uh, something that's been very important to us is that public engagement and participation. And so we wanted to really recognize everybody that had participated and taken the time to provide commentary on the plan. So uh, thank you to Tim for helping and signing quote unquote electronically all of those. That how many, how many were there general? I think there were over, I think we'll have, we have the exact number on a slide, but okay. it's around 60, 65. Okay. Yeah, so something else that is on our radar um, is making uh, all of the data and the results of this final regional flood plan available to other ongoing statewide efforts. Um, so, as y'all will recall, the uh, combined river basin flood study effort led by the general land office has uh, presented to this group on numerous occasions, including this past September, um, where they spoke to um, how uh, we are ensuring no duplication of effort between these two ongoing studies, um, how they're different, and also how we can leverage both of these um, to improve upon both the GLO study that's ongoing and future cycles of regional flood planning. Um, and so on our radar is to provide all of our final plan data to these study regions um, for them to utilize as they go into alternatives analysis. Since this is the first regional flood planning group meeting since submittal of the final plan, um, I want to highlight some major accomplishments on the part of this group and the part of this project effort. Um, what this group has been able to accomplish in effectively 18 months um, 
was a massive undertaking. And if you'll recall, the flood planning cycle is intended to be a five year cycle. Um, so what we've managed to put together and document in this plan um, in this abridged schedule um, is, is worth noting. Um, and from the onset of this project, something we've emphasized is that the objective of this first cycle is really to lay a solid foundation from which this group can continue to improve upon in subsequent cycles um, and subsequent amendments as this document continues to evolve through time. Um, something in particular, as Corey's mentioned, I think that differentiated this group from other regions in the state is public outreach. So the data we were able to provide to the public, um, the manner in which we provided it and the conscious accommodations that were made to be more inclusive of the diverse and multilingual population in our region, I think was really unique. Um, and so to talk more about that, I will turn it over to Connor Stokes with Holloway. If you're on the line, Connor. Thanks, Maggie. <laughs> Um, so, in addition to the regular monthly RFP meetings and committee meetings, um, the San Jacinto region hosted seven public meetings to educate the public about the regional flood planning process, um, the results, and also to solicit public input. Um, the San Jacinto region is one of the only, if not the only, RFPG with a public engagement committee. And in the first cycle, the committee met three times to direct and oversee engagement opportunities. This included strategically choosing meeting venues with access to public transportation, intentionally translating materials into Spanish to reach a broader audience, and selecting diverse locations for the printed draft plans. This engagement during the development of the regional flood plan resulted in more than 60 comments on the draft plan from stakeholders across the region. Next slide, please. Um, in addition to providing translated materials uh, at the public meetings themselves, the San Jacinto region also provided for Spanish interpreters during those public meetings and translated online resources like the online survey and interactive web maps. Next slide, please. Um, we also developed several video resources to assist stakeholders with providing input through the online survey and also summarize the flood planning process during the public meetings. Next slide, please. So during the first RFP, RFP cycle, uh, the San Jacinto region stakeholder list grew to over 1,000 contacts from representing different industries, municipalities, interests, and individuals. The San, Jac the San Jacinto website had over 19,000 visitors to the website, peaking on August 31st, 2022, with over 800 visitors in one day. The most viewed pages were the homepage, meetings page, and the technical documents page, which alone was nearly 3,000 visits. This is significant because the technical documents page is where the draft and final plans, as well as all technical memorandums are housed. Additionally, we sought to make the RFPG more accessible. This included the, devel the development of a story map to summarize the final plan and implementing an e-reader so readers could easily read the plan without having to download the document. And with that, Maggie, I'll turn it back over to you. Yeah, and just to emphasize that the last couple bullets that Connor mentioned, um, if y'all have not been to the San Jacinto website in a minute, um, y'all should go visit that because there have been some updates. We've incorporated the story map that we discussed last fall um, on the home page. That's also where folks can access the interactive GIS dashboard, which houses all of the data, supporting data that was used to develop the flood plan. Um, and on the technical documents page, we've, we've also implemented an e-reader so that folks don't need to download these really large cumbersome PDFs, but can simply scroll on that page um, and read the report. Yeah, it's it's very accessible and easy to read. They don't have to load anything. It automatically loads and they can interact and interface with that document right on the website. So if you haven't checked it out, please do. It's it's uh, I think a great way to communicate the contents of the plan to the larger general public. So moving right along on some major accomplishments. Um, 
we've got three more to go through. Um, but uh, this first one, I think, is is really important. We've been talking about data already at this meeting, but the the significant amount of data that we've managed to compile and process as part of this first cycle is it, it is truly massive. We've developed region wide data sets for a flood infrastructure of ongoing proposed flood mitigation projects of critical infrastructure, and we use those to perform exposure and vulnerability analyses region wide. So we took data sources from multiple data sources, combined them, standardized them, and then added detail. Um, and from what you can see on this, the picture on the screen, I mean, we're talking hundreds of thousands of data points. Um, but not only did we develop that and use that to create the flood plan, we also turned around and made it accessible to regional flood planning group members and to the public through an interactive GIS dashboard, which we've made available on our website. At the onset of the project, we also recognized that there would be four discrete water development board deliverables. So the technical memorandum, which was split in two parts, the draft regional flood plan, which was due last August, the final regional flood plan, which was due this past January, and the amended plan, which is due this summer. And so at each of those milestones, there's opportunity where we'll need to revise or update data. And so we recognize that there would be some repetitive tasks. Um, and so at the onset, we tried to identify opportunities for efficiency to incorporate automation so that we could standardize outputs, but also speed up the process, knowing we were going to have to do it several times over. Um, so we we made a point to develop tools um, and automate some of these processes to make things smoother as we continue through the first cycle. Um, and I'll, I'll emphasize it again. I think what we've done with these initial data sets is lay a really solid foundation to improve upon in the second cycle. Just not to sound like a broken record, but but thanks to all of the planning group members. Uh, Y'all dug deep, reached back into your respective organizations or those that you had contacts with to really help drive participation. Um, the number of entities that came to us to provide information and, and feedback throughout this process, whether it was different surveys that went out or call for data, et cetera. Um, the, the amount of participation that we had from stakeholders throughout the region was incredible. So thank you again to all of the planning group members uh, for helping drive that information and data participation to the plan. The next major accomplishment I'll speak to is that this process developed a region wide flood hazard layer. So, where different discrete data sources may have gaps in their mapping, like you'll see in the image um, on the right of the screen. Um, so, the NFHL layer in some areas has gaps. We were able to supplement that with uh, other data sources like base level engineering. Um, and that was a process that this group reviewed. The technical committee really helped to um, develop and present this process to the regional flood planning group. Um, and we we're able to have comprehensive floodplain coverage of the region for riverine and coastal flood risk for the 100 and 500 year event and for an existing and future condition 30 years out. Um, again, this is laying a solid foundation from which we can improve upon in the second cycle and incorporate data sets that um, incorporated Atlas 14 rainfall as we continue to improve our understanding of flood risk in the region. And then finally, the, the big one is this group um, identified and recommended hundreds of actions to better understand flood risk in the region and reduce flood risk in the region. And so that's inclusive of 349 evaluations, 63 strategies, and 36 projects amounting to a total cost of over $30 billion. Um, as y'all will recall, the regional flood plan, or one of the objectives of the regional flood plan is to serve as a vehicle for funding which essentially means that should a community want to seek funding assistance from the state, from the Water Development Board in the future to conduct these studies or construct these projects, 
um, in order to be eligible for that funding, those studies and projects need to be recommended in the plan. And so the, the prerogative that this group took to lean towards inclusivity as opposed to exclusivity for this first cycle um, and maximizing the funding eligibility of communities in the region means that this region, which is the second smallest in the state, I think, um, has the second most uh, recommended actions in this final regional flood plan. Yeah, and that's really the, the payoff of everyone's efforts uh, and, and what y'all were able to drive to this funding eligibility. We don't know all the details necessarily on how that funding will exist, but right now as the state legislature meets, initial budget has money going towards the flood infrastructure fund, additional funds potentially going to the Texas Water Development Board. Um, and so we'll we'll see how that unfolds, but this is, this is what was necessary to uh, position a lot of these elements. <laughs> to position uh, a lot of these projects and studies for future funding. So I know I've had conversations with a lot of y'all about what that looks like. And as, as we get more clarity and the Water Development Board gets more clarity and we work through the legislative session, uh, we'll, we'll provide that information. But the, the key, key st step and takeaway here is that uh, y'all were able to position a lot of uh, community members, stakeholders uh, for funding eligibility through this. So if we look at a comparison, uh, again, you'll see that just the number of uh, FMXs that was identified as a part of our region. Uh, number three, region three is the Trinity region. It's over three times as large as the San Jacinto by area, and we're about at the same size uh, number of projects that were identified. But if we go to the next slide, this is really, I think, telling. Uh, Thank you, Sally. Appreciate your input on this here. But uh, even if we remove the coastal storm risk management uh, that clocks in at 24 billion as represented in the plan, uh, y'all's y'all's plan here in the San Jacinto would still have the most funding that's been identified as a need for the region. So even if we remove uh, the coastal uh, storm risk management project, we still would be the top region in the entire state as far as funding. That has been requested uh, or identified as a need in our regional flood plan. So again, congratulations to everybody on the flood planning group uh, for your participation and or involvement. Thanks, Corey. <clears throat> um, comments, thoughts from the membership. Well, well this is Ali. I, I really appreciate those last two graphs that were shown, and maybe if we could go back to the one with the projects costs for just one moment. Um, I think one of the things that's so important for us to be thinking about as a planning group is that when the state flood plan is adopted in 2024, you must have your project in the state flood plan or you are not eligible for funding from the flood infrastructure fund. That really matters. So when you hear uh, Fries and Nichols going through, there we go, thanks for putting that up. But when, when you hear them talking about the importance of getting these projects in the regional flood plan, uh, you know, here in region three and all of the other regions across the state, um, the, 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 the real additional benefit of getting them listed as projects is that they are then teed up to be eligible to receive money through the flood infrastructure fund. And I think another thing that this does that's tremendously important during legislative session. So for any of you folks out there who might be legislators or on staff or talking to your legislator friends, um, you know, when you look at these numbers, this is the information that the legislature needs to understand how much money needs to be put into the flood infrastructure fund to be able to begin to make a dent. Um, and the original uh, funds that were put into the flood infrastructure fund, about $770 million, when those were put in, um, that was a wonderful start. We're all absolutely delighted that happened. Um, but we all can recognize, uh, given what you see in front of you uh, with respect to the statewide need that's already been articulated, that there's much, much more that needs to be done. Um, and so I view that the flood planning process under uh, Senate Bill 8 is being absolutely critical to drive the information that the legislature needs to then understand how much money needs to be provided um, through uh, Senate Bill 7's flood infrastructure fund. Um, and I'd like, Mr. Chairman, if I could just add a couple, one, a couple of quick add-ons to what Aaliyah said. Um, one, not only is it important to have these projects listed in the state flood plan to become eligible for Texas Water Development Board funding, 
it becomes a compelling statement when communicating with your members of Congress seeking funding for flood mitigation projects when you can point to projects being identified in the state flood plan. I mean, having that kind of consistent message both with state appropriators and federal appropriators, I think is, is very, very important. And while 30 plus billion dollars is a lot of money and there's no question about that, Leah is right, there is a lot of need. However, conversely, what this region contributes to this state's economy is also massive. And so this high price tag on this flood mitigation is an investment in um, an area that is really critical for this state's economy. Thank, thank you, Sally. Um, I, I think it's really key. Sally hit on a wonderful point, and that is the match that federal dollars have when they come to our state. And having a project that's in an authorized plan by the state of Texas that makes it eligible for dollars that come out of the state coffers that may be leveraged against local dollars is goes very far in getting that match, which gets you further up the list, which gets you an assignment and with the way Congress is operating now, I, I don't like using that term earmark, but that's really what it is. Being able for a congresswoman, a congressman to leverage that, look, my sponsors have 20, 30% of the money. I just need a little bit. And um, it goes a long way. And for our federal government, a billion here, a billion there is, doesn't seem to them to be as much as it does to us. And so, and I will encourage our membership through your context of state legislature to feel free to share this information. This is public information on our website and it's posted. Um, this is valuable for our, the state legislators who are not quite familiar with the flood planning or group and the flood planning state flood plan, which again, you got to remember this is two and a half to three year old concept that's never existed in the state of Texas before. And I think there will be quite a bit of fever about this project and these type of projects going into 2024, particularly in our 25 legislative cycle, when money is actually flowing down the hill to local entities and someone can say, oh, look, we thought it was just another state program, but this one has money. And I think the next cycle we have, we will see this need substantially grow as people recognize there is a way to solve some of our problems, which for the last two or three decades, we've been unable to achieve. Any other comments, thoughts from the membership before we move on to the action item they have? Mr. Juan, I wanna, the numbers are impressive and I'm, I'm proud of what we did there, but I wanna go back to, not go back to the slides, but think back on those slides where you talk about the public engagement. Um, as, as one of the representatives of the public, I'm real proud of the ability or what you guys did, honestly, to reach out, to get people involved, to, to speak the language that needed to be spoken, to, to, to bring this very technical information. The story map is just tremendous. And I think that was a great ad. I, I, to the extent that the other regions need this sort of thing, I hope, I hope they take a, a lesson from us and do that. But that part, Again, partly because of what my job here is, I, that was the part that really impressed me. So thank you guys for all that. That's it. Any other members have comments? Corey, I'll move on to the action <clears throat> item I believe you'll have. Yeah, so uh, we will pivot here and uh, I'll let Maggie give an update on the budget amendment uh, and, and talk about the additional tasks. Right, so um, with the submittal of the final plan on January 10th, tasks 1 through 11 um, expired. And so all remaining budget in those tasks, um, of which what you'll see on the screen are some, some pretty minor budgets um, with respect to the total budget of each of those tasks, um, would no longer be eligible for reimbursement. And so what we're requesting um, or proposing to the group to do is to shift all remaining budget in tasks one through 11 down into tasks 12 and 13, which are these amendment plan tasks, which we're actively working on. Um, and the amended plan will be due in the summer um, of 2023. 
So just to note, I know Claudia and Fatima distributed some updated meeting materials last evening, I believe. So there were a couple minor changes to these values, but on the whole, um, the ask is the same. Um, shifting minor budget remaining in tasks 1 through 11 to tasks 12 and 13. And I'll note that um, although task 12 is the um, task that's focused on elevating FMEs currently recommended in the plan to FMPs, task 13 is where um, will be where the effort to incorporate additional data that's been submitted from sponsors um, into the plan. So that's where that's captured, and that's why a significant amount of remaining budget is being transferred into task 13. Okay. Um, I, I know there's a lot of pluses and minuses up there. What do you feel is a number that we're able to collect from non reused funds that we're bringing forward to the next two tasks is it a the total amount that's being shifted from tasks 1 through 11 right, to yeah. tasks 12 and 13 is about $66,000 my, my math wasn't too far off all right question Jean no, I just want to make sure to put it in perspective of the 3 million almost 3.1 million right am I reading that right right 66,000 y'all didn't use up in the first 11 tasks. Right. And that's available to, to the extent that we approve it today to shift that down and use it in the remaining two tasks. That's Correct. what it is. So it's a, it's a very small percentage. Right. But it's, it's, it's significant to those last two tasks. Right. Okay, thank you. Great. Any other comments, thoughts from membership? Do I hear a, a motion to approve the adjustment and residual funds through task 1 through 11 to be applied to task 12 and 13 for our technical consultant? So move. I'll make that motion. I got a motion by Steve and a second by Dean. All right. Any further discussion? Except our computer's about to restart no. on her screen. Um, <laughs> Hearing none, I'll call for a vote. All those are members of the budget amendment to our technical consultants budget to reallocate residual funds from task 1 through 11 to 12 and 13 indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? Motion carries. Thank you. Do you have anything else, Corey? Uh, we do. Uh, we'll try to get through it relatively quickly, but we're going to give an update. Uh, we Wanted to spend a few minutes giving a look back and kind of recap the accomplishments of the planning group and the regional flood plan. And so now we're going to talk about path forward here, uh, what we're going to be accomplishing under tasks 12 and 13. So under task 12, uh, as mentioned, we've, we've gone through this prioritization framework that has been developed by the planning group, and that is being used to guide the evaluation of FMEs that were identified in the plan, uh, but may have been missing a little bit of information or data to get them to that FMP. So the regional or the Texas Water Development Board allocated additional funds to the regional planning and flood planning groups to uh, try to maximize the number of FMPs that we have in the regional and the state flood plan. And so task 12 goes towards that end. And as we talked about, there's additional data that's being provided to try to incorporate additional FMPs, FMEs, uh, other content into the plan uh, that's subsequent to that that final plan that was submitted. So again, we're just trying to maximize uh, both total content and number of FM FMXs, uh, but through task 12, trying to elevate identified FMEs to FMPs. So Maggie's gonna talk a little bit more. We're gonna step through uh, just very quick overview on some of those FMEs that we're looking at as a part of task 12. All right. So. Um... The group this past fall spent several meetings thinking through how to select the FMEs that we would execute under task 12 and developed a prioritization framework um, that ranked FMEs that were currently recommended in the plan um, in a way that would allow us to reach out to sponsors, get their approval um, to spend this effort 
to elevate FMEs to FMPs, um, collect additional data that was necessary, and um, if we are able to work efficiently, continue to move down that list. Um, given our short schedule, I think this was a, a smart way to approach it um, so that we were able to be flexible in, in what we're able to accomplish. And so we've been reaching out to sponsors um, and I wanted to give a brief update on kind of the result of that sponsor outreach. Um, so we've been able to um, collect uh, sponsor concurrence and sufficient data to elevate 12 FMEs to FMPs thus far. Um, there are an additional four FMEs that we've received approval from sponsors to execute, but are still waiting on some additional data. Um, and then we've received notice that at least a minimum of four FMEs should be elevated um, by the sponsors themselves. So sponsors have elected to use their own resources to elevate projects um, and get that data to us for inclusion in the amended plan. So question, this would potentially take our, I think 36 that we have now, almost up by 20 projects of FMPs? Um, I think a total, I think at a minimum 15 is what we're looking at here. Oh. So we've got a task 12 budget now as a result of the budget memo, um, about 400 thousand um, dollars. That's also inclusive of documentation, revisions to the plan, um, support and preparation for regional flood planning group meetings. So given that we anticipate being able to elevate a minimum of 11 FMEs to FMPs as part of this amended plan. Um, but as you'll see, we've got additional data that's coming in. So as we're able to be efficient and we're currently working on executing these FMEs right now, um, as we're able to be efficient, um, and if we are able to get data in time from sponsors, we'll continue to work down that list. Um, We'd expect to go from the 36 currently identified FMPs to at least the uh, 47 or so. We're pushing close to 50, and, yeah. and as we get additional data, then that'll help drive even more the number of FMPs that we get included. Through this process, will we also have more refined cost information that, um, or either an FME cost is more refined or could have be actually even increased? Do we, will we get new cost information? Go for so for, um, and I think maybe I know where you're going. So for the study cost that's identified for FMEs, that should be fixed. We should have a pretty good understanding of what that study cost is, is either provided by that sponsor and been identified in some sort of plan. Um, one of the things that we do intend on pulling together and making sure we have fully captured is where available, trying to identify the construction cost associated with FMEs. So an FME may not have all the information necessary um, and it may not have a cost estimate in OPCC <laughs> being one of them to get it to that FMP status. But if we have an FME that maybe just didn't have in a statement of no adverse impact or um, didn't have a benefit cost analysis performed or other data missing, but it has an estimate of construction cost. Uh, the intent is to try to include that information in the amended final plan so that in addition to the FMP construction cost, we do have some sort of picture of the FME construction cost, kind of, again, trying to point to that total need uh, that we have in the, in the region. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Right, and so uh, additional um, detailed documentation of our sponsor outreach to date um, has also been provided as supplemental meeting materials um, just for y'all's awareness. Um, but um, right now, I'd just like to take a moment to kind of walk through those 11 FMEs that we've begun work on. Um, oops. Yeah. Um, so what you'll see in each of these slides, we're going to give you know a brief overview since there are 11, but we'll try to focus in on who the sponsors are, what the rank of that FME was in our original prior to prioritize framework, um, and just some minor details. So up first is um, 
a FME from the city of Conroe, Rivershaw West. So this includes storm sewer improvements, roadside ditch grading, um, and additional improvements along Alligator Creek within the city of Conroe. And as we're going through this, you know, we're, we're focused on giving a, a brief update, but we do have other members of our technical consultant team on the line and here in person that should there be any, any questions, um, they might be better equipped to, to answer some of those more detailed questions. So, next rank number 5, we've got 37th street project within the city of Galveston. This includes roadway improvements as well as um, the implementation of a stormwater pump station. Um, we've also included costs on these slides, which gives y'all um, an understanding of the scale of some of these projects. Um, so this comes in at, at 75 million. Next, um, we've got goose Creek. Flood risk reduction phases 1, 2 and 3. So, something unique about this is, uh, originally each of these phases of improvements along Bruce Creek were included as individual FMEs. But because they are modeled together and because there wasn't a significant difference in level of effort to develop a benefit cost analysis for 1 phase versus. All three phases together, we chose to incorporate the overall proposed project on Goose Creek as a single FMP so that all components of that project would be eligible for future funding. Also on the list, rank nine is um, improvements on White Oak Bayou, including offline detention basin um, sponsored by Harris County Flood Control District. We might be having some clicking difficulties. Yeah. Um, also sponsored by Harris County flood control district improvements along Willow Creek. This is, um. Uh, near the Tomball area, um, including additional, um, detention mitigation. Next, um, kind of. Jumping around the region, there's also a project, um, including improvements along Willow Fork, um, sponsored by the Fort Bend County drainage district. I think as you'll see, as we go through this is there's really good geographic variability in the FMEs that, um, we're actually executing under task 12. Moving into the, the neck of the woods we're in now in our meeting location, um, city of Friendswood has a, uh, proposed project that will be elevated, um, at a cost of 66 million. Also sponsored by the Harris County flood control district improvements, um, along South Mady Creek within the addicts reservoir watershed. At rank 22, we've got another, um, we've got an FMP sponsored by the city of Pearland, um, which include improvements to Mary's Creek. Originally, again, similar to Goose Creek, improvements to Mary's Creek were phased and listed in the plan as separate, three separate FMEs. But again, because they were modeled together and because there wasn't a significant difference in level of effort to develop a benefit cost analysis for one phase versus all three phases together. Um, we went ahead and combined all components of the improvements on Mary's Creek as a single FMP so that all of those components would be eligible for future funding. I'll just walk through the next couple. Um, Additional improvements or FMPs um, focused on reducing flood risk on Keegan's Bayou and the Braze Bayou watershed. And um, along Blalick Road, sponsored by Piney Point Village. And last but not least, um, at rank 35, um, um, there are flood mitigation projects um, that should be elevated that are. Um, Focused on the Kingwood area. 
And so that that concludes kind of our overview of the FMEs that we are currently working to elevate under task 12. Um, wanted to, to pause for a moment to see if there were any questions in particular from the group. I do see some hands raised. Thanks, Meg. I think we have Elise hand up. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm just curious if there is a project that requires, for example, a statement of no adverse impact or such, and the sponsor wants to continue to work, you know, to develop that. Is does that mean that the consultant would be available to meet and to work through that, or is it limited to these identified projects? It seems like there were some other projects that you know had the potential to be included with not that much effort, but maybe they didn't meet the you know priority, what have you. Yeah, I think. Well, we wouldn't be able to necessarily allocate funding uh, to perform. The effort to generate some of that additional data that's needed, I think in that case, like you mentioned, the statement of no adverse impact, we're happy to continue meeting um, to talk through what would be necessary to generate that information uh, so that it checks the box um, for that FMP requirement. And that would be through, uh, just the, I guess, the, the prior contact. Okay. Yeah, as, as Maggie mentioned with task 13, part of that is trying to get additional information incorporated into the plan that may not necessarily be the work that the planning group is doing to elevate FMEs. So, um, you know, we do want to continue driving data towards the plan as we're able to. Um, I think is that Matt has his hand up. Yeah, thank you, Tim. Um, there are a few items on the spreadsheet list we got where it says, you know, one sponsor, I guess there was an initial sponsor who indicated it really should be another sponsor that had the project. Ranks 2 and 11 would be examples. And then it says the sponsor removed the FME from consideration. Was that the original sponsor who said it wasn't theirs who removed it from consideration or was the other sponsor given the chance to make that call? I just wanted to make sure they weren't overlooked. Does that, does that make sense? Right. Um. Right, and so in those particular instances, do you think you said rank two and eleven? Yeah, yeah. both of those instances, we coordinated closely with both Harris County Engineering and Harris County Flood Control District to get feedback on who would be most appropriate to be the sponsor, um, and then received feedback from that appropriate sponsor that that was not a prioritized FME to be elevated as part of task 12. Okay, thank you. Gene? I have an observation that when you let off, you talked about the priorities and how we wanted to make sure that, that this process made sense. And my recollection was we were looking for some diversity in geography and we were looking for diversity among the, the sponsors, the size of the sponsors and so forth. And to, I think to some extent, we did y'all did a pretty good job of doing that because I'm looking and I kind of looked at the maps. You hit it geographically and I saw some some uh, sponsors that I didn't expect to see. So good good work on that. Thanks. And correct me if I would be wrong, but some projects, by the time it's made it through this 18th month window, a sponsor may have said, well, look, that was on our list, but we got funding and we're, we're moving forward on that job. And it, the projects that they're elevating are projects that they, they're seeking money so they can go implement it and that can be a reason something came off the list. Right. In a lot of cases, when we reached back out to sponsors, they would indicated that, oh, this is something that we're actually prioritizing now. We don't want to wait for an undetermined amount of time to get funding in the future. This is something that's a focus now. And so there's no need to spend regional flood planning group funds to elevate it because we're working on that currently. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments, questions from the membership? Hearing none. Uh, this concludes your portion there, Corey. Yep. Okay, thank you. We'll move on to the next item, which I believe is going to be item number 10. No, yes, item number 10. Presentation update from the technical consultant on outgoing outreach activities, discussion, and possible action 
from the regional flood planning group as it pertains to ongoing efforts. I think y'all were just going, there's not much to my memory on this item. Right. I think a lot of that was covered under the agenda item number nine. Thank you. Move on to item number 11. Approval and certification of administrative expenses incurred by the project sponsor for the development of the regional flood plan. You may remember when we last met, we didn't have um, bookkeeping hadn't been completed yet for administrative expenses. Um, on the screen, they present the administrative expenses through um, November and December and moving into this month and to January, I mean. Um, the amount is consistent with, with what we have seen in past um, financial requests, um, reviewed it with staff, uh, reviewed it with our sponsor. And I'm, I'm comfortable with what's been presented, but seek a motion to approve administrative expenses for our project sponsor. So moved, Aaliyah. I'll second. <clears throat> this one. I have a motion and a second to approve the certification of administrative expenses incurred by our project sponsor. Any further discussion, comments, questions? Hearing none, I'll call for a vote. All those in favor of approval of administrative expenses for Harris County, indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? Motion carries. All right, move on to item number 12. Presentation to 2023 planning group key dates and deadlines. Um, I think we've gone over a little bit of our planning schedule. Um, I believe we are going to have something to review. Oh, she got us. That's right. We put one in here. So um, early April, we'll be getting some information, correct? Right. So there will be information made available to the group um, to review FMXs that have been elevated to FMPs and additional FMXs that have been um, submitted for consideration to be included in the plan um, with the aim of meeting the regional flood planning group meeting in April to to vote to recommend those. Okay, so our, our key action item from the technical consultant standpoint, April meeting will be to vote on the work that y'all have developed plus information provided by either new project sponsors or existing project sponsors. Okay, then um, in May, Looks like you're providing us some reading material for an amended plan. And then in June, we get to have a great discussion and consideration of the amended plan that will be due in July. Am I correct? Correct. So from uh, planning group members, we will be meeting in April and we will be meeting in June. Um, our meeting location will be the subsidence district. For the members not present today and for those who are here, appreciate you being here and look forward to all those that could join us at this venue. Um, okay. I think I covered most of number 12. All right, Maybe move on to item 13. This is a standing item. It's the update and discussion pertaining to in-person regional flood planning group meeting locations. We we had this item up since we began our meetings. You know, we were meeting in 2022 at Hark up in the Woodlands. We moved to um, the subsidence district trying to be present something that's a little different, get some new involvement, new engagement. We are continuing to investigate moving to a more centralized location available to public transportation and ability to garner more public input. We're continuing to work on that, but through the June meeting, we will be meeting at the subsidence district. Next item, consider agenda items for the next meeting. Um, our next meeting again will be on April 13th. Um, the key item, I believe that at least from the technical committee, stand, technical consultant standpoint will be um, information pertaining to these new FMX, FMXs. Um, that'll be an item that'll come under their agenda item. We'll keep our traditional items on. I don't know of any special item at this point in time. If something comes up between now and posting date, we'll make sure the membership is aware and it'll be included in the next agenda. Item 15, public comments. Fatima, Claudia, have there been any additional public comments or is anyone's hand raised? 
Yes, I'd like to talk. All right. Introduce yourself, sir. Hi, my name is Mike Dock, D A C H. I'm a coordinator of the Addicts Flood Mitigation Network. Um, we had uh, commented uh, back in uh, November that there appeared to be no plan to protect the Addicts Reservoir perimeter communities in, in your uh, program. And we got a, a letter from uh, uh, an email letter from Tim Butcher uh, dated uh, December 1st, confirming that there was no plan to protect those communities. So subsequently, uh, we turned out a, another letter dated uh, January 31st, uh, recommending that you include a plan that was uh, formulated by the CPC, which is the Coastal Prairie Conservancy, and uh, it's called the Absorb, Slow, and Store Plan. And uh, we felt that that was the, the best available plan uh, right now that uh, we could recommend with you know, with a formal outline that would protect the, uh, we have over 10,000 homes that were flooded in these communities by Hurricane Harvey, and there, there's not anything uh, being done right now. So that I just wanna remind you that we made that recommendation and we would like to be included, we'd like that plan to be included uh, in your submittal to the, uh, the Texas uh, agencies for future funding. Mr. Doc, ap appreciate the comment and, and I'm sure if you presented another letter, it'll get itself over to um, the membership. And we typically don't respond to comments in the um, public forum. I will just make mention as general information, the regional flood planning group doesn't originate the projects that are in the regional state flood plan, particularly for region six, that those need to come from a political entity and organization. However, I'm sure upon receipt of a letter, our technical consultant at a minimum will reaching back out to you. Um, but as it, we don't put those projects in the plan, they do come from the sponsor, but we really do appreciate your comment. And I think many of us are aware of the need on the north side, west side of the attics and the serious issues that came for the flooding that was outside the core easement. So thank you for being here today. Yeah, I would assume that the uh, Harris County Flood Control District would be the most likely sponsor, but we, we have reached out to them uh, on other projects in our area and they, they've not been receptive uh, to date. And we've lost uh, contact with, uh, you know, the contacts that we had with Harris County Flood Control have uh, tended to move on uh, in, in the recent months. Thank you, Mr. Doc. Are there any other public comments or questions? Lisa? Melissa? Uh, yeah, I would just like to comment. Um, you made the statement that projects may only be submitted by um, political agencies, and I do not believe that is the case. There are a group of nonprofit organizations um, that are stakeholders, you know, that are active in, you know, land conservation in the region and have been submitting projects. So I, I just do want to clarify that the Coastal Prairie Conservancy um, has a number of um, flood management strategies and um, evaluations and, you know, we're slightly under a resource, but are working to elevate those to um, projects and I'm very familiar with the plan um, referenced by uh, Mr. Doc and you know that is conceptual and I appreciate the statements to have that um, included and you know we will continue to work um, you know by ourselves but also collaboratively with the relevant um, you know flood agencies to um, you know work to include um, plans and projects um, on the west side so thank you for that comment. Yes, thank you. And we'll continue to dialogue with our technical consultant and water development board about 
um, sponsorships. And Tim, could I jump in real quick? Um, um, yes, Dr. Peterson. Uh, so just for Mr. Doc, um, my name is Tina Peterson. I'm the executive director at Flood Control District. So you are welcome to reach out to me um, with the, we've already received the information actually that you shared uh, from the technical consultant. So you're welcome to reach out to me, but my staff will reach out to you to make sure you have a, a connection with the organization. Thank you. Tim. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Claudia, if a team, any more comments, questions? Thank you. Move on to item number 16. Um, it's 1029 AM on February 9th. Appreciate the participation and the regional flood planning group meeting, not only those members in attendance, but the general public and we are adjourned. Isn't it nice to have a gavel? Oh. Uh, I have a gavel, a little trap. Like, right.